Hi, hello, and welcome to another episode of, of course, China. Today we're here in Shenzhen with Daniel Dumbril at his uh, brew pub, Taps. And uh, Daniel is, um, Daniel's videos uh, on YouTube in the recent uh, 12 months or a little bit more have been uh, thought provoking, eye opening, articulated, and I think uh, quite important to, I think, millions of people, millions of views at least, I believe. Um, and we are really thankful to uh, have a seat with you today. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. We've been talking about this for a while, so it's nice to finally make this happen. Yeah, cool. All right, guys, so uh, if you want to see the rest of the show, don't go anywhere. See you after the intro. Hey, Daniel. Hey, how you Again? doing? Cool. It's great to meet you, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice to finally meet up. I want to uh, first start with uh, getting to know who is Daniel Dumbrill, because you kind of been uh, uh, very popular online in the past year, whether you planned it or not. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, definitely didn't plan it. Uh, just uh, I started really vlogging when the Hong Kong protest uh, began, and I just saw how skewed the narrative was, and I just said, okay, there's not many people speaking out against this, uh, especially the, um, the xenophobia that was going on in Hong Kong. And um, that was something I had uh, personal experience with, which we can uh, discuss later, not me personally, but my wife, who's mainland Chinese. And I just thought, okay, somebody needs to balance this out a little bit, talk about the other side of the narrative. Um, so that's where it started. I didn't know where it was going to go. Um, you just picked I, up a camera and... Yeah, my first, I think my first vlog was outside. Uh, yeah, I was talking about um, some of the real xenophobia that was showing up online and how weird it was that this was considered acceptable. You had um, district councillors saying really rude things about mainlanders and things like that, uh, things like this. And I just thought, where, this wouldn't be acceptable anywhere else. This is really weird. And um, so I thought I'd, uh, I'd I'd start talking about it. That's where that's where it all started. So that what are you what are you trying to achieve with this this video? You thought okay, I need I need to tell people what I think and wh why they are wrong. Balance the narrative. Just balance the narrative. Give people the other perspective. You know, there were people in Hong Kong, especially during the protests, especially after they became violent, um, that had similar ideas, thoughts, and things they wanted to say as me, uh, but they wouldn't dare say it because the risk was too high. The right. protesters were again, they were quite yes. violent. They. They lit a man on fire. They were lighting uh, political opponents' offices on fire. Um, they were attacking the, um, the the Maxim canteens because the owner's relative said something they didn't like. Like it was not a, a, a ideal situation to speak up. Right. I used to live in Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong ID card holder. And if I was still living in Hong Kong, I wouldn't have spoken up. I wouldn't have said anything. I've got kids. Um, and again, they were dangerous. They were violent. But I, I felt safe in Shenzhen. I said I have this opportunity to speak up. Um, so I did. I didn't, I didn't tell, at that point, I, I was regularly communicating with my Hong Kong friends to kind of keep my finger on the pulse and, mm -hmm. and figure out what was going on. But I would never really talk to them about where I stood politically, where, you know, that I was really kind of against the protesters and things like that. I just, you know, it, uh, there were a lot of relationships in Hong Kong that were broken up from people who were on different sides of the aisle right. in terms of that topic. But after I put my video out, my videos out, and they got a lot of views, they got shared on Facebook amongst Hong Kongers, and um, I had so many people reach out to me, and they said exactly what I thought that was happening, was that they didn't, you know, they thanked me for putting these videos up, because they said they, they don't have the ability to speak right. up. Right. With regards to the Hong Kong situation, um, I wanted to ask you a question. What is your understanding of where things started? Did it start with the, the Taiwan extradition, or... Where did uh, it start? The, 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 uh, so the well, yeah, the extradition bill was uh, definitely a spark, um, in, and it was something that was wildly like the extradition bill is something I dug into really deeply, and that was something that was completely misrepresented in the media also, and just that whole story around um, the well, I'm going a little bit off topic. I'll talk about that in a second, but that that definitely was a spark. I think it was used as a, an excuse. I think a lot of these, there's no question about it. There was foreign funding in Hong Kong for it through the NED mm -hmm. and their funding programs, and they've even admitted it themselves that this is what they do, and this is what they've done all around the world. They take uh, real pre-existing issues in a society and they use it as an event to kind of spark something. Um, you know, we, we we had something similar happen in my mother's country of Guyana. I could talk about that later, but. Um, that was the spark. It shouldn't have been as big of an issue as it was, uh, but it was definitely uh, capitalized on. Um, 
and that was yeah that was a messed up situation too it was a guy who murdered his girlfriend in taiwan and they wanted to send him back um and nobody has concerns with the fact that this guy's loose on the streets he's free mm -hmm. and taiwan kept saying well it's a you know we we we, we want a separate agreement with hong kong we don't want to share an agreement with china on this um, and they said it was, you know, uh, it was this issue. But, you know, after the guy uh, was released from uh, prison in Hong Kong on unrelated charges, um, something to do with money laundering or something related to that uh, because of the way he used his uh, girlfriend's bank card, um, he, a pastor, while he was in prison, convinced him to turn himself in to Taiwan after he came out. And uh, so after he came out, he says, okay, I'm going to turn myself in. I'm going to fly back to Taiwan. Taiwan refused him. They said, no, <laughs> you right. can't. It's like, what, 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 was, what was this about then? I thought this was about the extradition bill. And they, they said, no. Then they came up with these ridiculous terms where they said, uh, we, you have to give uh, Taiwanese uh, police officers um, authority in Hong Kong, authorization where they can fly over and they can make the arrest in Hong Kong. And like, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Like the, the mainland's not going to recognize tai, Taiwan security, you know, the police force to make an official arrest in Hong Kong. He says, no, he's ready to fly over. He's ready to come over. No, 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 no. So YouTube, your videos about the Hong Kong situation on YouTube um, were the ones that sparked your, your popularity uh, nowadays on YouTube. Um, were you at any point calling it uh, terrorism? I, yeah, I regularly did call it terrorism. Do you I, have I tried... any issues with YouTube because of that? Um, not in the beginning, no. Um, I, I, I did get... Uh, with Twitter, I got suspended a few times from talking about what these terrorists did. But um, I can't really remember because I don't, I don't really... I mean, a, a bunch of my videos did get uh, demonetized or they go to the, you know, the yellow uh, the, uh, dollar sign where you only get like really ridiculous ads like <laughs> Falun Gong uh, conveniently <laughs> for, for them. Um, but uh, maybe, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. I didn't pay attention to it. You, you are not. Uh, you don't seem to do it uh, for uh, monetizing. No, that's not. I mean, that's it's not my source of income. It's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. This wasn't your plan. It's it's not your plan still. Yeah, right? it wasn't my plan. It's not my plan. I mean, right. if it grows into something bigger, and then may, like if I if I build a team around it or something like that to to get better right. content, then maybe I would I would do more. Right. I would focus more on the monetization for the purposes of paying the team right. and making sure it's self sufficient. Right. But while it's me, just myself, yeah, it, does, it, it doesn't matter. So if if a video was demonetized, it didn't didn't yeah. really. Does matter. it cross your mind to develop it? bigger um on and off you know it's it's a lot of work it's very tiring um and i, I just try to focus on I, i'm trying to figure out like how much difference am i really making uh, uh you know i know i have changed some people's minds or at least made people step back a little bit but as long as i thought you know if i could make enough of a of a, of a difference and I, i'm not sure i can yet I, I know my channel grew really quickly but if I was really sure about that, or I said, you know what, yeah, this is important enough, I think I can make a difference, then yeah, I would consider that. But uh, isn't that uh, why you're doing? We're still doing it because you know it's making a difference, I am, even but, it's, if yeah. it's small. But. There, there are things that kind of uh, discourage me a little bit, like this thing that happened in Canada, where they they, they said that what's happening in Xinjiang is a genocide, and they basically had testimonies from, the, I think it was the Uyghur Friendship Group or some, some, something else like that, that is funded by the NED. Um, and they had no counter arguments or anything like that uh, presented. Uh, I, I just felt like there's a, I don't know, I don't know what's going on. That kind of made me lose hope a little bit that people can uh, think about things reasonably because that was all, um, like the most ridiculous thing for me. Right. So uh, you got just frustrated. That. Yeah. Right. How do you, how do you deal with, uh, you know, you get a lot of love, I think, but you also get hate. Yeah. If you look, if you search for your name on YouTube, oh yeah, 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 yeah. you get some stuff, right? I see this Tibetan guy recently, right, and, and right. quite a few people, right? The the usual suspects, maybe this uh, prime guy or whatever, but yeah. but there are quite a few things. How do you deal with that? Um, I I don't mind actually. I think it's part of like this whole thing has been kind of like a psychological experience where just seeing how people react, um, how much people who stand who say they stand for free speech try to silence you uh, because you're saying something they don't like it's just an interesting experience um so i'm okay with it uh, the most intense was after tibet there was a like a basically a bot farm from from india uh, and especially right. saying the free Probably tibet thousands of them showed up on Dharam my twitter or something. Was, yeah, oh yeah. yeah 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 like they have they have these groups that, right. yeah, that that was kind of intense that was like whoa it was still an inter interesting experience and i'm glad it happened um, but then when the, when some of the real people came out, 
and they started criticizing me and also another uh, 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 another person on Twitter from um, New Jersey uh, uh, named Samir Khan. It was really interesting to see them. Like there were these these people because they got really offended that we talked about the feudal past in um, in Tibet. How there was uh, three classes of society. Um, it was a very right. oppressive system, um, and it was you know if you were born into the third class, the lowest class of society, there was no your kids wouldn't be able to get out of that. It was basically slavery. Um, and when somebody pointed that out, uh, this person from uh, India, a, a Tibetan whose parents fled uh, Tibet. When they came out, uh, they, they made a video, and they were they were criticizing Samira, who, who she's uh, she did like beauty pageants before and stuff like that. And she says you're just a third class beauty queen, and she had this hate in her. And it's like you're doing exactly what we're saying. You guys, t- you know, <laughs> right. we're, these yeah. cla- we're saying that it was a feudal society with three classes, and you're saying no, it wasn't. You third class beauty queen. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, hold on a second. Do you realize what you just said? <laughs> so you don't you don't sorry you don't cry in the shower. No, 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 no. Right? So I would you, say, you I take would say, it then. I would say the only one that's got creepy, a little bit creepy, is the is the prime guy. Okay. <laughs> uh, because uh, he's got a, a very troubled past with uh, animal abuse and uh, um, and really, I mean, you've, se- you've probably seen the police report. Really, right? Yeah. Gruesome, right. We saw some of these. Do, do, do you get any threats? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. You get uh, like serious threats. threats? Something um, makes you scared. Uh, I just like again creeped out. There was a Hong Kong protester who posted pictures of my kids and said, "Oh God bless your kids." Oh, that's something scare like me. That. Wow, that's kind of like creepy. Uh, but I, I feel safe in in in, in Shenzhen. Like okay. um, again, that goes back to the point. If I was in Hong Kong, hell no, I wouldn't be speaking <laughs> up. These, these these are the kinds of people that. It's very interesting how you mention that just because you are in China, you have the freedom to do this. <laughs> yeah, and there's that's an interesting there's an interesting story in that where the, one of the um, there was a, a Hong Kong artist who came over to do a pop up show here in uh, Shoko Nanshan. And when she came across, she uh, and I met her there. She's like, oh, I, and she made a sign. She said, "I can. F- I'm finally free to say whatever I want." Because you that? know, she, <laughs> that, like she comes over to the mainland, and now she's free to say what she wants yeah. because she knows if she's in Hong Kong. Yeah, and you how know, it's changed. she says that. And you know, I, I mean, I've seen debates here with other people uh, in, in different like, camping groups and stuff like that, like people who empathize with the Hong Kong protesters, and they're allowed to have these discussions with their friends here who totally disagree with them. Right. And they have these discussions, and their friends aren't going to light them on fire, right. Right. you know. Mm. But this is what was happening in Hong Kong. In so Hong it really Kong is it really is ironic. Mm. Yeah. I wanted to to mention the fact that when I see your videos, I see that you do a lot of research and that you. I think you'd like to read history, mm. right? Um, how do you feel about countries rewriting their own history? I mean, when you talk about Tibet and whatnot, there's just different versions of what took place. How do you know that you're not making a mistake, that you're reading the actual history? I mean, there's always, uh, there's always that. I mean, with the Tibet, with the narrative in Tibet, um, I was really careful about that um, because, I mean, you know, whether you're listening to the foreign version or the China version, everybody's going to have their angle on it. But uh, w- with Tibet, I mean, everything that even from people who were not friendly to China, like British explorers or, you know, people from Nepal, they, they, their history, what their, their uh, history of what Tibet was like back in those feudal days matches up with what China says it was like during that time. And the, one of the uh, most important books I read, Battleground to Tibet, um, was written by a German scholar who really did a lot of research and it, it came from outside of China. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm really careful about that. I mean, I don't really consume Chinese media. That's not where I get my information from. I follow it and I'll see it and I'll, I'll, I'll you know, verify some of it before I really kind of uh, believe in it too much. But um, I try to kind of stay neutral in that sense. And besides, I mean, Chinese media, they don't know how to tell their story really well either. Yeah, so I think it's that. easy to get influenced. Depends where you spend. I was in, I was in the teachings of the Dalai Lama for two weeks mm. in Dharamsala before. Oh, yeah. And that's where I came to China from, India. Oh, wow. Yes, so I spent a lot of time with Tibetan in exile. So I was stayed in Dharamsala for two months. Yeah. And uh, you just get that narrative. I just got that narrative when I was there. But then you come into China, skeptical... And then you, you meet the people. And, but I, I don't feel like, I, I, at least in the past, I, I don't feel like I can talk to people about it, to Chinese people. Right. I'm worried I, to bring up this subject. You don't feel the same with Chinese people in your friends? No, not really. It's I mean, fine to discuss it. I'm, I'm, and I like finding... Um, to I'm, argue it, to... to yeah, I mean, I, I found it really interesting. Uh, you know, so in, in Tibet, I've been to Tibet a couple of times, and um, I have a friend there... Uh, who doesn't like the Chinese government? 
okay. who thinks his life is meaningless without the Dalai Lama. Right. And I was really, I was very interested to talk to him. You know, I mean, th those people are, are perhaps few and far between, or there might be, you know, the idea that everybody is 100% happy anywhere is ridiculous. You, you can find someone uh, who doesn't like their situation if you really want to. But I was lucky enough, and I say lucky enough because that's who you should be interacting right. with. You should be interacting with people who don't uh, share your viewpoints. Right. And um, I just kind of... Uh, was talking to him through all of these different uh, scenarios. I didn't want to debate him because that seems really like, like this is his, he's Tibetan. He's from Tibet. That would seem like really kind of, I, I don't know. I don't know what the right word is. Um, A label? Or? No, it's just like, it's not my place to tell him. I, I mean, I wouldn't tell him that he's wrong. Mm -hmm. I just want to understand it from his perspectives, but I would test different ideas on him. I'd say, you know, uh, the Dalai Lama's uh, own brother, he wrote, you know, he wrote in his book that one of the biggest mistakes he had was uh, cooperating with the CIA. And if, if, if the CIA had got it their way, it would have, you know, they would have turned Tibet into another Middle Eastern country that they've, you know, uh, mm. liberated mm -hmm. uh, right. and turned it into an absolute mess. And I ran, I ran some of these ideas by him and um, he, he kind of, he empathized with them. He's like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But the most important thing for him was his spiritual connection to the Dalai Lama. And there's nothing, there's no amount of, um, I want to say, I want to say logic, because that may, right. may sound, that may be sound disrespectful towards religion, but there's no amount of, of, of other information that will sway him from that. It's like, yeah, okay, that makes sense, but still. But you still wanted to hear his side. I it did. It was important I, for I, you. It was, yeah, it was important for yeah, me. Right. I mean, you've, you've seen on my uh, show from the perspective of like, who, who do I invite on my show on the Xinjiang narrative? I had, you know, Rushan Abbas, uh, the, the activist from the U.S. who worked in Guantanamo Bay and is funded by the NED. I had uh, Arslan uh, Hidiat uh, from uh, the Turkish uh, Australian who uh, says his father was uh, detained in China. That's right. what I want. That's what I want to do. I think that's what people should do. I reached out to some of the, one of the most prolific uh, anti-China vloggers for a debate also. Mm -hmm. um, and I put it out there. I said, well, I'll even choose a moderator who's anti-China. I'll leave it. Well, what do you want to do? What are the right. terms? If he wants to, him and his buddy, two on one, three on one, no problem. Come, Were you, you know? a part of a debate club in school or something? No, I mean, I wasn't. it seems you're different than the China YouTubers, the other ones, right? I wasn't. Uh, no, I wasn't. Um, I, there was a debate club in, in high school, <laughs> and I saw, uh, like, the quality of guys that were there in those debate clubs. They were like, I didn't think I could ever be on their level. Okay. I was like, this is like... I had like a little bit of an interest, but when I saw them, I kind of got discouraged. I'm like, I'm not that level. Right. Talking uh, about about um, YouTube and uh, debate, uh, somebody that I quote a lot, I quote you, and I quote also Cyrus Jensen. Right. Lately, he posted something on Twitter saying that 2020 was the year of the China YouTuber. That that a lot of people just came out and we became more prominent. Uh, others well, more than right. others, right? Yeah. Um, but um, I wanted to I wanted to ask you. Um, what do you think is the role of YouTube vis-a-vis uh, -vis mainstream media? Uh, the, I think YouTube, um, I mean, it's a great outlet to, to hear different opinions and stuff like that, but I think there still is an underlying um, risk when you look at um, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, when things get really, really too, when you push the limits too far, they, like I think it was Facebook or it was Twitter who basically said they removed accounts for undermining the uh, confidence in NATO. Mm. It's like that that's that happened a couple of days ago. Yeah, it's like right. wait, 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 hold on a second. You you uh, you, you know when you push the limit or Andre uh, uh, what's his name? Andre uh, he he was found uh, 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 he was found dead in his car last year. Um, and oh, sorry, uh, we got off camera but what Vichik, yes, Vichik. that's it. I mean, he um, uh, he had some amazing pieces of information on um, uh, uh, the terrorism that was faced in Xinjiang, outside influences, outside forces. You are completely banned from being able to post that on Facebook, on Twitter, and you can't even send it in a direct message to somebody on those platforms. What is uh, your understanding of the banning of Facebook, Twitter, YouTube by the Chinese government? Um, so I think... Uh, the ability for the West to do uh, to run psychological warfare operations is far greater than than China's ability to counteract it. Uh, China is a major target uh, for the West, and it, you know, going through these social media platforms to influence people or to create an uprising or something like that is a real risk. Um, and you can see um, the the double standard also. So, for example, I give you an example in face when Facebook when the riots were happening in Xinjiang, and the Chinese government reached out to Facebook to say. Uh, okay, you know, these terrorist groups, they're, um, 
they're, they're organizing. Yeah, they're organizing in these groups, and you know, can you shut these groups down? Like people are being killed, and they said, no, that's not that's, sorry, that's not how it works. So okay, fine, we block the whole thing. In India, I don't know if you noticed. In India, the the when uh, the the Communist Party members in India were talking about the uprising of the farmers and all of the the terrible things the government were doing. Twitter uh, and these flat platforms uh, blocked them from India. If you were in India and you had an Indian IP address, you couldn't see them anymore. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, America doesn't have an interest in destabilizing India. On the contrary, it, it, creating it as a counterbalance to China is probably one of their potential uh, goals. So you can see that in the double standard also, saying, no, 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 you've got terrorism issue? Ooh, that's, you know, that's what we were counting on. That's what it seems like. I know mm -hmm. that sounds conspiracy theory-ish, <laughs> but there's no doubt that uh, China is a target of the U.S. There's no, there's no, there's no amount of convincing I need to do on that. It's very apparent by what's going on. So I think as a matter of national security, I think uh, they they blocked it. I think it's unfortunate that they had to do that, but it's because of what they're up against. You know, my my going to the story that I was almost mentioning at the beginning, my mother's country. Um, they had uh, when they had their first president Chetty Jagan elected um, he was a little bit Marxist Lenin leaning and America didn't like that they didn't want another Cuba situation in the region so they basically spurred and these are declassified documents they're available now it was a CIA MI5 joint operation um, they spurred racial riots in the country from pe people of African descent and Indian descent started killing each other and um, and it was for the purpose and then you know the British came in and suspended Parliament and basically a, a new person came to power who was not so Marxist Leninist leaning anymore surprise surprise conveniently <laughs> so I, I, I often think like what would it have been like back then if Guyana had an opportunity to censor wherever this information was coming and obviously it was not on the internet at that point but if they could have implemented some sort of a censorship system to protect themselves would they have been far better off than they are now with maybe nationalized nat natural resources you know and and would their people be far better off than they are now i mean they're not it's not a great situation in guyana so freedom of speech shouldn't be given at any cost that's what you well, say well freedom of speech would be a really nice thing to have uh, for everybody but what you have to consider when you're that much of a target um, from, from one of the world's biggest superpowers you got to do what you got to do to protect yourself. Right. Does it mean those limitations on free speech won't be overused by the government to then control dissent against your own government, like legitimate issues? That's probably going to happen also. Right. But, but you know, the, the core reason why it's there to begin right. with is because of this, um, this situation. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I understand the context of it. I don't like it. I was here in China when YouTube all of a sudden became blocked. I was like, right. this is, you know, this is crap. But <laughs> yeah. um, getting into this, you know, especially, I mean, the, the, the thing that fascinated me about Hong Kong also is because I always wondered about that event in Guyana, about how, how could they really have done that? And when I saw the events unfolding in Hong Kong, you know, before the riots, before all this stuff, there was an underlying tension between, you know, Hong Kongers and mainlanders. There was this, you know, uh, sometimes a little bit of a superior su superiority complex um, or legitimate issues of too many travelers coming over or wh whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, there were legitimate issues there. And uh, I, 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 that was really a key part of the, the, the protest. Also, if you saw who was being targeted. And then if you trace it back, you look at Jimmy Lai's uh, uh, media uh, outlets, his magazines and things like that. He was calling mainlanders uh, locusts yeah. and doing all of these things. And, and, and this guy's somebody who's really well connected to high up people in the US government. So to me, it looks like I was witnessing, I had the chance to see how would it have unfolded and what would they have done in Guyana? How would it have really happened? So it, that was fascinating for me also, because I'm sure in Guyana, there was an underlying tension between racial groups there, but they found somebody, they found a key figure to stoke it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's what happened. Uh, that's what happened in Hong Kong, also. But that's these are some of the things I think about when thinking about censorship and the validity of it. So you, sorry, you you started your your YouTube with the Hong Kong situation, and then you went into the Tibet situation. What other topics, um, Xinjiang? You've talked about it. What do you think are some of the uh, greatest vulnerabilities that China has? In terms of media and, and well, the, yeah, the the greatest uh, vulnerability is um, is the, the, the younger generation. You know, so China has been a country that's been improving at an amazing rate. Um, I think the the rate of improvement will be uh, will slow down. 
you know, like compared to my wife's generation, when she was a kid, if she wanted colored pencils or something like that, she had to go out and find berries or something like that so she could use the different colors. So, like the kids who are like 20 years old today or something like that, they're not going to see this level of change. And they all know how to use VPNs and stuff like that. Um, so I think they're going to be able to go on to, you know, Epic Times, Outlets, Radio Free Asia, all this stuff, and, and become brainwashed by this stuff. Um, I think that's... Uh, that's the biggest risk. It would have happened sooner without censorship, but I think there still is a risk of this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially considering the Chinese media is really lacking in their ability to tell their story correctly. Um, they, they're the, I mean, you've got, like when you look at the comparison with Western media, Western media looks like they have like true, real marketing gurus behind it. Like they know how to craft a story and make right. it mm -hmm. juicy and stuff like that. Right. China doesn't know how to do that. So uh, discontent uh, youth who lose sight of the fact of how much China is improving and how much better China is from other countries in, in many regards, uh, that's going to be that's going to be All the right. risk outside of the regular destabilizing terrorism in Xinjiang or you know because obviously the U.S. Uh, delisted ETIM as a terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. um, that makes me think that they're going to line something up to want to support these groups. Um, so outside of the immediate threat of terrorism, uh, U.S.-sponsored terrorism, which is a regular thing around the world everywhere else, um, that would be the next challenge, I think. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, actually you talk about this and how uh, people like you actually help uh, solve that vulnerability, you know, with reaching those people with, with, that, with, let's say, better stories and convincing arguments right after this break. Okay. And we're back. Yep, we're back with Daniel Tombrell. <laughs> All right, so we were talking about, you were saying that uh, Chinese media maybe is not doing the best job they can mm. uh, in making the story more impactful and, um, and explain to people around the world um, in a better way their side, right? Um, and then suddenly there are more Chinese, China YouTubers, foreigners, right? Like right. you, like Fernando, um, uh, some of the other ones, Cyrus, of course, um, that are helping. Uh, China to get the story out in a better way, right? Right. But that gets backlash too, right? People calling you guys shills. Right, right. What do you think about that? I mean, if um, if promoting uh, reasonability and uh, you know a balanced narrative or having both sides of the story, uh, if, if that's if I'm a shill for that, then sure, I'm a shill for that. I'm a shill for being reasonable and not hearing just such a it, 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 like an anti-China side. Right. Without any nuance or reasonability, um, you know things in China um, aren't perfect. You know there are issues that they need to work through, um, but I think definitely there's an importance to uh, prioritize fighting back against some of the outright false things. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this idea obviously people uh, try to draw conclusions that you're working with, you know, government agencies or things like that. Right. And you know, if if, if there's somebody who's convinced of that. I, I don't care. You know, if that's what they think, then I, I, there's no way I'm going to get through to them. But I'm putting my ideas out there, hoping that people will uh, listen to reason and have a little bit more balance. Um, and if people want to call me a shill for that, then do you fine. think? Do you think that some of the China YouTubers go too far? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Some of them. Define yeah. define too far. Uh, for like you, just, what, what's oh, too like, far for you? Like, like over the top. Like uh, you know, some are just. They don't, they don't, like, uh, and I don't know if it's so much YouTube. I've seen some videos, like, on uh, Douyin and stuff like that where, or, or, like, people who only focus on Douyin and only focus on Chinese uh, social media. It's like, well, what, what's the use? Like, you're gonna, they're going to see a foreigner saying, I love China, and you're going to get a they lot of... They just want the likes and the yeah, clicks, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It's like, what's, what's the... Let's face it. Chinese people love a foreigner uh, speaking very positively about China. I think some people do it so ridiculously that some people are seeing through it, and right. um, they are they're like, okay, this guy's just like kind of you like uh, taking right. advantage of us. Right. I, I think I think some people uh, are seeing through that, and that that kind of stuff uh, hurts us. It doesn't help us. Can you, know? you give an example of one of your things, your videos you've done that you actually gave some of the other side that you were very careful not to go over the top? You know, you know what I mean. Well, I mean, like as an example, uh, when, when the discrimination issue happened in Guangzhou um, with uh, the Africans in Guangzhou, I was one of the first YouTubers to put a video out saying that this is wrong. Like, this is, this is not, you know, this shouldn't be happening. And uh, I had a lot of my longtime followers who were upset at that. And right. they said, you know, they were like angry at me. And I just 
basically told them they can, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I don't care. Like, right. that's, that's wrong. There's not, you know, now China did an amazing job after that to put campaigns out there to, to, to tell people that you shouldn't discriminate against foreigners. They had advertisements in the subways, right. uh, a Shenzhen subway talking about, you know, you respect uh, the foreigners' religious freedoms, their privacy, their, you know, and you, you know, these are things you don't do. Um, so it was impressive, a follow-up, but um, that's an example of, you know, something that I think is important for, for balance. So and you, That makes you more authentic, in my opinion, uh, doing that yeah, kind of and thing. And an, I think it, in long term, even those that were angry with you, it's changing their perspective in the long, long run. Yeah, I mean, I hope, I hope it comes like, like there might be like some uh, people who are very, you know, nationalistic here right. or th something like that, that they, they don't want to yeah. hear uh, anything negative about their country. But maybe if they see, okay, this is somebody who's really overall positive about China and he's saying this is an issue. Maybe we can think about right. Uh, right. what we can do to improve the situation. You were talking earlier about um, how China's media, uh, they still need a lot to learn. They still need to improve a lot. Um, to, to get their message out there. Right. What's your What's your take on um, channels like CGTN and, and certain state um, officials uh, being on Twitter, being on Western Western media, trying to? Uh, do you think that's a step in the right direction? They have a long way to go. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, some of them do a pretty good job. Uh, like the the the. Uh, Chen, Chen, Chen Weihua or something. I, he's the Ch uh, China Daily. Uh, yeah, Chen I mean, Weihua. He really bit back. He goes down into Mike he, Pompeo. He went no, when there, <laughs> there was, when there was the when there was the um, when <laughs> where there was the, the picture. No, no, no. There was one uh, congresswoman, and she said uh, China has a thousand yeah a thousand years of history of uh, cheating and stealing <laughs> or whatever. Mm -hmm. Basically, word for word, what Pompeo said he did in the CIA. Yeah. But he said, you know, and then he just replied with a BITC, you know. <laughs> you know uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, whether that was right or not, I don't know. But, but there was a lot of people, even Americans were like, you know, because Marco Rubio, he reposted. He, re he didn't retweet him. He did a screenshot so nobody could see how rude the first uh, thing was that he responded to. And yeah. he just said, you see, this is China state media, you right. know, using this misogynistic kind of insult right. or whatever it was. And even Americans who thought, you know, the thought very lowly of her, even they were like, well, you know, he's kind of right. <laughs> so so now, I think getting a bit of a backbone um, is, uh, it, it's, I mean, I have, I have mixed feelings about it. They always took this approach where they just never, right. they were always just very careful about it. They were never really disrespectful to anybody. But I, I think everybody's, everybody's reasonably got their limit, right? Mm -hmm. um, They're fed up. Yeah. So I think I think I think for them being on Twitter and being on these platforms, it's it's, it's no problem. But uh, what the best approach is, I'm not sure. You know, of course, there's going to be people overseas. Who, no matter what, if it's coming from somebody who works for Chinese state media, it, they're not just not going to listen to to them anyways. I wanted I wanted to talk to you about this particular issue, credibility. For example, um, all these lies that have been uh, spewed onto the internet, uh, people like Adrian Sands, ASPI, uh, BBC, this just just tales about Xinjiang. Nobody's saying that. There's no issues in Xinjiang, but the way they're presenting it, that's not exactly the way it is. Now, what I've seen on Twitter is a lot of video productions from Uyghur people um, telling Mike Pompeo that this is not the way it is, this is not the way it is. But the immediate reaction of the people who are going to be watching that is, of course they're going to say that. They just find somebody, two, three, five, ten, twenty people, to make these videos and, and, and just say that there is no genocide. How does China win? I mean, what's the strategy? I mean, they just need to, I think they need to get better people in to, to teach them how to tell their story. Like, I mean, that was, there are many, um, you know, there's a story of um, one of the top students won some award in Wuhan University of, of Uyghur uh, ethnicity, you know, it just made a little bit of a blip. And, but then they focus on pushing this weird thing. There's plenty of people they can feature in Xinjiang or show their happy, normal lives. But when you all of a sudden get like 20 people to make a direct message to Mike Pompeo, it just, it's like coordinated. It's like it's so and I, I believe that those people saying what they're saying, they really believe what they're saying and that it's true. But it, 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 it looks like a coordinated campaign. Like how many people are going to, you know, really be doing this on their own, thinking of this on their own. I'm going to send a message to Mike Pompeo and mm -hmm. then it's Chinese state. I mean, so what is it? I mean, Beijing is very smart. So they can't figure out this doesn't work in, you know, um, the mentality of the Western uh, people online, uh, not reacting the way they, they would like it to be. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, 
the way I see is that they used to communicate into the Chinese people. Right. So there's a way to tell them, oh, this is the this is what's taking place. This is the good things that we're doing. This right. When you watch uh, Chinese news, there's rarely ever like anything negative, but. Um, the great expertise of the West is to create narratives that can be positive or negative. It can take something right. and turn it negative. I think that the Chinese media doesn't have that ability to twist things, to 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 turn things into to spin stuff. Right. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Maybe yes. it's the, the lack of yes. uh, competition in the domestic market. Like if they really Maybe. had to fight back yeah. against Western propaganda in China, I think they would have thrown a lot more resources at it. They would have had a lot more highly educated people in marketing strategies, psychological warfare right. and all this mm -hmm. stuff to do this. But they don't because they're they're in this protected bubble within China. Where right. credibility is given by the lack of competition. But what else are you going to listen to? What else are yeah. you going to watch? Right. But out there, you got to fight for that credibility. Hey, we have the truth. We have the and yeah do you feel i mean in the in a way i want to say that what they need is a thousand daniel Dumber Dumber, you know <laughs> I don't know about that. but i mean um w w do you do you do you get that feeling sometimes do they contact you are they i mean reaching out and and want to encourage you to do more of what you're doing and um there there was uh there, there are people that reach out on a regular basis. They want to interview me or something like that. Like, I mean, this week I probably had about four or five requests. I, uh, right. I declined uh, all of them. And Chinese media? Yeah, Chinese media. Um, I've gone on Chinese media, but I try to minimize it. Um, Why? Uh, Time is one thing, I guess. But It's more like... Uh, it, I mean, the unfortunate nature of when we... Our message... There's no Western media channel that's going to put us on their channel to talk about it. You know, I remember when I remember <laughs> seeing an interview with Max Blumenthal when he was on CGTN, and he started the interview out by prefacing it by saying, "I just want to let everybody know here know that you know the, the I think he was talking about debunking the the Wuhan lab uh, virus leak lab uh, story, which he wrote a big report on, and he contacted so many U.S. media outlets. Nobody wanted him on. Nobody wanted him on debunking that story. Hmm. And so the first thing he said on the CGTN uh, channel was, "I just want everybody to know the reason I'm here on Chinese state media." is because none of our own media wants to hear this none wow. of our this is my only option here um, so even though uh, that's very true and if I wanted to get my voice out there a bit more going on these Chinese media stations might be the best thing but I think like if I if I overdo it it looks like I'm just I'm really a part of the system here right mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm, I'm worried about that because my uh, goal is not to you know become some sort of a celebrity or something like that it's really to try to get people to listen and say there's a real problem here with the narrative that's out there um so actually if they get what they want it's back to what we said before um they it's it will backfire like if they get you on their uh different state medias five times a week every week uh, they yeah. will actually ruin Daniel Dumbrill in a way I, for I, them I, I, and it will yeah. weaken yes your I think message. so you know yeah. I mean like I go back and forth uh, on, on the idea like if they, they have big platforms and stuff like that like if they had um like, I sometimes wish they had, uh, you know, RT has some really good hosts. They have American hosts and stuff like that. They get on and mm -hmm. they talk about the issues. Um, I think China should have that also. Um, I'm not necessarily saying uh, uh, me, but some, somebody like that that has that inclination or wants to do that. That might be useful, but I'm still, I'm not sure whether it would be a net positive or a net negative uh, if I cooperated more uh, with some of these channels. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so I'm just careful about it. I might do some more stuff with them in the future, but sure. like you know the 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 the, the CR, CRI trip to Xi'an, I, I didn't I didn't go on. Uh, I was invited on that, and then went to Beijing or something like that. Right. Um, and I I uh, yeah, I think Fernando was, was in Beijing. I was in them. Beijing. Yeah, yes. it was really appealing and stuff like that. But again, I just I, maybe I'm over cautious, maybe I'm over careful. But I just was like I, I'm gonna s stay away from this for now. Have you ever been to Xinjiang? Would you like to go to Xinjiang? Uh, Xinjiang, so I have Uyghur friends here in uh, China, but I haven't been, uh, I'm planning a Xinjiang trip this summer. There's a big RV group that's going out there. So I'm going to be taking our RVs. You know, there's re certain restrictions in Xinjiang uh, where, y you know, like uh, your, your RV usually has a gas tank and stuff like that for mm -hmm. cooking. You're not allowed to take gas tanks in and stuff like that. But for this group, there's going to be a, like an exception made. Oh, and oh okay. They're getting be, with the right people. Yeah, yeah. It's like a big group that's <laughs> like a tour by the tourism board. It's not It's not oh. a media trip. It's just like people who enjoy RVing. Oh. I think there's even going to be Uyghur people who own RVs. Oh, and cool. so that would be cool. I, I, 
I'm, I'm going not to make a video out of it or to vlog, but I'm, it's going to be irresistible. It's a beautiful yeah. place. It's going to be, yeah. So you're saying that uh, uh, foreign media don't want you uh, to interview people like you? Well, I mean, I've reached out to uh, some people or media people or politicians or things like that to, you know, clarify uh, positions or to, yeah, to talk about it. And, yeah, they're, they're, not really, they're not really that interested. What are they afraid of? Um, so it's a, I don't know if, um, it really is this nefarious kind of a plot to manufacture a certain narrative or not, but I do know that, um, you would think that this is interesting for their, even if you, uh, provoke hate, it's yeah. good for sales. Yeah. Do you know, that's what you would think. Yeah. I right. mean, there are probably are some more, uh, like if I really tried hard enough, maybe there's probably some more aggressive kind of journalists who thinks, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to own this guy or whatever right. that I could probably get onto. But, um, in terms of somebody really giving you an honest interview where they're not going to cut you in a certain way where they're going to, you know, just try to continue to craft their story. I think there's a pressure on people overseas to agree with the China bad narrative. Like when somebody like I give you like these politicians who voted uh, for calling this Uyghur situation in Xinjiang a genocide. I don't think they're properly equipped with all of the uh, information. But if you look at from their perspective, if they were to considering that they don't have all the necessary information in front of them, if they were to disagree with calling it a genocide and later they found out that it was a genocide, that will never leave them. That would be a very bad thing for them. If they uh, call it a genocide and later they find out, oh, we were tricked by U.S. propaganda again, you know, like the WMDs and stuff like that, the consequences aren't as great. You still, you know, messed up. And that still is a bad thing because we're so stupid to keep falling for these things when all the warning signs are there. But still, the personal consequences are lower. So when you're faced with a situation when you don't have sufficient information, I can understand why they're saying, yeah, oh, yeah, uh, genocide, that's a bad word. I don't like that. And, you know, mm. let's... Did, did 10 years ago anyone care about uh, Xinjiang around the world? No. No, really? Yeah, yeah. No. I mean, so what is it? With China getting more uh, power? They don't, they don't, um, I mean, they don't, they don't care about the, uh, the Muslims who are being targeted in India either. Right. Um, they don't seem to care much about the, uh, the Muslims that were slaughtered by the Australian SAS forces, where we have actual video Footage. of them <laughs> jumping out of a helicopter and shooting farmers face down mm. in their fields. Mm. Like, you know, we're talking about blurry satellite images that ended up being shopping malls that we're calling this a genocide on. And we've got actual footage of Australian SAS soldiers shooting farmers in the back of the head, shooting mm. Muslim farmers in the back of the head. So they're why, just following... why, why is Canada Parliament, why are these uh, governments, now I'm getting a little bit, you know, <laughs> why are they not uh, finding a way to punish uh, uh, Australia for something, taking away something from them instead of saying we want to take the Beijing Olympics away? What what the hell right. kind of a, a just China is, is an this? easier target maybe? Well, no, China is an important target. The, so that's an important thing too. We never talk about the why. Why does America want to do this? China is now set to overtake uh, America as the world's biggest economy. Uh, uh, resource-rich countries in uh, in Africa and Latin America are choosing to work with China instead of the U.S. In Europe, before as well. there was no right. before there was no competition for these rich resources, and America could do whatever the hell they wanted. They could go in, they could exploit them, they could exploit their people, they could overthrow governments that didn't agree with the way they wanted to do their version of right. capitalism. Right. They would install a dictator. So it's not about democracy either. And now, all of a sudden, there's another option for these countries. And no matter what these countries want to say about China, about how terrible their debt trap diplomacy options are, how terrible these, you know, these programs are that China's going in, these countries are choosing out of their free will to deal with China. Mm -hmm. So if you want to say, fine, if you want to say China's options are so bad, how much more worse are your options that they're choosing to still deal with China? Uh -huh. Ask yourself that question. So uh, It's ego. So it's well, ego. well, no, no, it's 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 uh, it's a uh, c global control. It's control over uh, re uh, uh, resource-rich countries, uh, being able to exploit them for minimal at minimal cost. It's about U.S. dollar hegemony. You know, China's coming out with the digital RMB. This could be something. You know, they're already settling oil payments in RMB in many places. This is a huge threat to the the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is not something you challenge. You know, uh, Gaddafi tried to do it. <laughs> but here's the thing. I mean, right. the, the the U.S. dollar. If the U.S. dollar collapses, right? China owns most of America's debt 
so it's also detrimental to them. Well, China's been selling off a lot of their their debt. Mm -hmm. um, they've been they've been uh, de-risking themselves. And they've also been taking um, uh, physical delivery on gold purchases from the U.S. because there's a lot of speculation around the fact that the U.S. doesn't have uh, reserves. The, yeah, the, the amount of reserves that they actually say that they've oversold uh, the amount of gold that they're actually holding. Uh, so there's a lot of pieces. I mean, the the, the whole yeah, the whole fiat uh, currency system is a house of cards that if it collapses, it will affect China also. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we kind of um, uh, uh, kind of rise from the the the, the ashes. Uh, China's in a pretty good uh, situation to be the you know next global superpower. I cannot feel like we are uh, in a collision course to a, a hot conflict. I'm, I'm worried about the same thing. I mean, that's what drives uh, a lot of my reason to continue making content as same well. for me. Yeah, I mean, um, I think when stories get this ridiculous, like with the Tursenay story of this, you know, woman who was, you know, uh, she said she was Three raped different interviews. and beaten. She's on the fourth version of her story. Her passport was renewed while she was under house arrest, apparently. And when CNN ran the story, they kept all of the uh, regular information on her passport, all of the most sensitive information. But free, the date of issue. But they, the date of issue, they blurred out. The only thing that that does is blur out the hole in her story. Um, so when when and, and, and when BBC ran that story, they retweeted it seven times in 24 hours. So when propaganda gets this ridiculous, and when it becomes this pushed, um, you do have to worry about well, what's next? You're creating an enemy. They yeah, yeah. I mean, they air. say you know you, you you have to first villainize your enemy before you engage them, or else how are you going to sleep with yourself at night? But uh, I don't necessarily think it is to uh, warm people up to the idea of a hot conflict, a war with China. I think it's more to discredit China, to get these other countries to say, well, we don't want to deal with the genocidal regime. Uh, we'll, we're going to stick with our uh, American option or whatever, our Western uh, uh, imperialist options. I don't... Uh, uh, I think that's what it's about rather than a hot conflict. But the problem is, is that it also creates conditions which are ripe for Americans to be complacent with uh, U.S. warships sailing off the coast of China in the South China Sea where they don't have an issue with it because they're like, yeah, F China, because they're, you know, who cares? They're a genocidal regime. Whereas if, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, China was sailing off the same distance off of the U.S. coast, it would be a declaration of war. So what it does is it just increases tensions where all we need now is a small spark, a small mistake, a mistake. just something that was unintended that snowballs into a, into a conflict unlike any Anything our world has ever seen before. Do you think there My is less chance now with Biden instead more of Trump? You think there is more, oh, chance? more chance? Well, I think yeah. that Biden, okay, the way I see it is that Biden has a, a, a mandate. He needs to reignite the economy of the United States. And my understanding is that the military is one of the most important industries in the United States. So how do you reignite the economy without reigniting war somewhere? Well, yeah, I think um, if you look at uh, Biden's voting history, if you look at the people he's uh, stacked his staff with, the uh, ex-military, ex-military industrial complex, um, it doesn't paint a good picture for uh, Biden being an anti-war candidate. Mm. Um, I think uh, I think there's even more of a risk of that. I mean, you know, what is it's been only been a couple months. So a few hours ago, they dropped their first bomb on Syria. You know? Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Just okay. uh, you know, they just started bombing Syria now. Oh. Um, so they're you know his military industrial complex, uh, you know, staffers are going to be happy about that. How mm. much does each bomb cost? You know, but um, no, I think uh, I think there's more of a risk. I think if you look at uh, as many things as there were to dislike about Trump. If you look at the record of uh, past presidents over the past number of decades, um, he didn't really start any new conflicts. He could have really created, he was very close to with Iran, you know, mm -hmm. with uh, assassinating Soleimani. I think maybe he gave that a good shot to try to create a conflict. But when you look at, you know, compared to Obama, how many regions he expanded into, you know, with Libya, Syria, all these kind of places, um, uh, I think Biden is going to be uh, a much bigger risk in terms of a hot war with with anybody. Right. All right. I wanted to talk more Quebec a bit, mm -hmm. right? Okay. <laughs> cool off. Okay. Cool off. And talk about your story, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, start with, like, I wanted to ask you if there is any system to how do you approach making the videos? Uh, do you do you do you write it down? Do, how do you plan a video, one of your videos on your channel? Um, I prefer like having uh, discussions uh, with people. I, I don't. I don't like writing things down. And, okay. Um, 
you know, if it's a really, I have a problem where I don't know how to make a short video. <laughs> My I, I, I saw that, that you were saying that uh, maybe you should discredit me because I keep telling you it's going to be yeah, short and it's yeah, not yeah. short. I can't make a short video. So <laughs> sometimes when I'm like, okay, this is a really important topic, but I want to hit all the points. So, so I'll, right. I'll put together my points. Um, so it's bullet points. Bullet points. I prefer bullet points rather than word for word because right. you can see when you're sure. reading it word for word. So bullet points to remind me of the points I need to hit. I prefer doing that. Um, but my number one is I like having conversations with people about right. it and hashing out ideas that way. So, you know, the situation in Canada, uh, there's somebody uh, who's been covering this who I really want to talk to. He shares a lot of the same ideas. So this is somebody who I actually share ideas with. And I want to be able to hash out these ideas with him in a conversation format. Um, I, I prefer that. I'm very bad at kind of record keeping and, you know, tracking things like that. So, yeah. <laughs> You're not about making videos, editing, making them cool I, and I don't funny. Know they, uh, yeah. You're not into the, this kind of thing. I don't know. The, the, yeah. This is the most high-tech equipment I've seen in a, you know, I've never, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I, I don't know how to do transitions or anything like that. I just right. throw videos together with, with whatever, uh, wh wh yeah, however I can. I'm, right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I want to uh, talk more about your, your where you came from, your personal life, how you got here. But sure, your, your journey to yes. China. But we're going to do that after this very short break. All right. And we are back with Daniel Dumbrell. Daniel, um, we wanted to know a little bit about your, your journey to China. Uh, what brought you to China? When did that happen? And well, what has your life been here since the moment you arrived? So, um, yeah, I came to China to do, uh, so I had an import-export business, and I could have still run that business from Canada. I did a, a, a trade show in Hong Kong, a Global Sources trade show, I think 2007 or somewhere around there, and um, I uh, popped over to Shenzhen and just kind of fell in love with the place. I said, this is really cool. I went to like Huachang Bay and all these kinds of places, these busy areas, and I said, you know, I was kind of bored in Canada. I was like, you know, I was, re I was ready for something different. So I just decided very shortly after that to just come over and just... You, you moved know, to Hong run, Kong? Run, oh. uh, that was Shenzhen first. Hong Kong was in the middle. Ah, okay. Um, and um, just run my business from here. And then um, in the beginning... You're doing export-import with China, yeah, from Canada. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. To, uh, fr from, from China to, uh, to Canada mostly. Okay. And then, uh, and then I br built up some inter customers in the uh, Philippines, Germany, all, kind of all over the place. Can I ask what, what, what product? What do you do? I was what? doing, uh, first before was mobile, mobile phone accessories. Okay. And the other is uh, uh, reusable shopping bags. Uh, it's an mm. obscure product. It's How? like uh, uh, Wufang Bu, uh, polypropylene material. How did you start that? When, at what age? Were you a young entrepreneur? I, mean, I, was, I was doing business from when I was like, from when I was like, 17, 18, I was always doing some business or right. another, you know. Um, and then it just kind of it was a progression. I worked at a, a big technology company in, in Canada for a while. Then I left to do my own uh, mobile phone accessories. And then um, I was focusing, I was specialized in BlackBerry. I had a black a brand of BlackBerry. <laughs> oh, the old times. Yeah. But, you know, that was, uh, it was really go it was going really well. And, I mean, I was paying Google AdWords, like, tens of thousands of dollars per month but it worked uh, right it worked but then when blackberry crashed oof, everything like w it was a tough situation during that and i was living in like the you know the village apartments here in shenzhen and stuff like that. i had to build myself back up oh yeah <laughs> and then so now i was now you know have the brew pub and stuff like that so i built my way back up um so it was a journey like i i got i got to experience um going from being poor in in china to being fairly, you know, uh, set set now, uh, right. and so I'm able to, you know, and if, I, and if I can do that as a foreigner here, I had way more challenges than a local would have, like opening this place and mm -hmm. navigating the Xiaofang, the all the rules for the the fire and all this kind of stuff, and uh, it really uh, paints a, 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 a great picture for how many opportunities there are here. Did you um, you came in 2007? You're saying. Uh, 2008 was when I f kind of started permanently living here. But you've been coming here years before? Um, uh, no, no, no like not 2007 really. was like pretty much first the time. first time and then uh, just and I jumped right in. You speak Chinese well. Uh, uh, well enough to get around. Well, and to how did that start? What? So I would, uh, I, I just would, I didn't really have any expat friends for the first five years I was here. All my friends were Chinese um, and they didn't, a lot of them didn't speak English. Uh, one of my favorite uh, restaurants in Baishijou, Hunan restaurant, I used to 
I used to eat with the staff. Like they would have their staff meals, and I thought their staff <laughs> meals were tastier than the actual menu food because it was like their actual <laughs> yeah. Lao Jats high, yeah. you know, like yeah. it was more spicy and stuff like that. So I'd sit down with them and we chat. And and obviously the problem was when I first started learning Chinese, uh, because they're all from Hunan. I, I, I my originally my Chinese had a very thick Hunan accent, <laughs> and so you, know, you the, just pick it up or you do classes. Didn't take classes. Yeah. Never classes. Never. No. Mm. And then so yeah, the first time I went to Beijing, the you know the Beijing local people would say uh, like, "Hey, how's your how's your guy? This foreigner, why does this foreigner have a Hunan accent? Why does this foreigner have a Hunan accent?" Do you speak any other languages? Um, no, just like a little bit of Hunan Hua, a little bit of Jiangxi Hua, but no, just Chinese, English, English. English, Chinese, and some like dialects in um, in Chinese. Right. Like uh, so, so yeah, a lot of the words I learned like uh, were you know Hunan Hua because especially when you're drinking with uh, you know uh, restaurant people. staff, they're they're Hunan, they're, you know, they're gonna start speaking their local dialect. <laughs> so you <laughs> how? What did you you know a lot of. I think most foreigners are not like that. They come to China, they don't uh, find their bubble. Get together, yeah, they find their bubble. They don't get together with the Chinese in this, that way. Well, I, what made you? I didn't do that deliberately. Um, uh, at that time in Bai Shijou, there weren't really any foreigners there. I, I didn't really ever venture out to Shirko, which is really the expat community. Right. Um, uh, I didn't necessarily deliberately try to avoid, f you know, the expat community in the beginning. Um, it just worked out that way, and I'm glad it did because maybe I would have fallen into a bubble, right? And uh, not really understood. Like my friends are not; you, they're, they're from all different levels. Like I'm, ta I'm like talking like, like chefs at a restaurant. Like right. they come over to my house, hang out with me. You know, the the people downstairs that own the the uh, little shops and stuff like that. I'm still friends with them. When I walk through the, you know, know so many people in that neighborhood in the village area by Shijou. Um, so I feel like I really got to know uh, China from a really kind of grassroots level. You were always, I guess, a very social, sociable person because it seems like, yeah, you probably walk in the street and talk to everybody. Yeah, like, like with, uh, what should be a five minute walk would take 30 minutes because we know all the. Hello, 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 hello. You, you so, must yeah. enjoy it because otherwise you wouldn't. I, I like it, yeah, I like yeah. it. And, and like, we we're, were friends with their kids, like, their kids, we saw them grow up from, like, you know, now they're in university and right. stuff like that. And it, it, it's, we used to. Uh, uh, my wife and I we used to go uh, rollerblading with them like around the shopping mall and stuff like that they would always <laughs> hang out with us uh, and so seeing them like in university now going on to you know like these people are like family mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know they own little mahjong shops or you know little right. hardware shops and stuff like that you yeah. really localized you really uh, localized yeah I think yes. yeah and they're, and they're from all different places in China too right. so you get the kind of you know some of them are from Sichuan some from Hunan right. some from these different places so you really uh, get a, a, a feel for what people are like from these remote areas from just this one place here in Shenzhen. Did you have any, like 20 years ago, did you ever, did you think you would ever live in China? No. I knew I had to get out of my small town, uh, but I just thought that meant to like Toronto or something like that. Like I grew up <laughs> in this small, like nothing town north of right. Toronto and it was just, you know, the people there, they, they were like so many of them, they'd never even left the province in their entire life. And, mm, uh, right. um, I enjoyed my childhood there. Uh, you know, it was an interesting experience, but I, I, I would never, you know, it's not like here in China, like everybody, you know, the Lao Jia, they've got these romantic ideas about the place mm -hmm. they grew up. I could never, ever, ever see myself living there. Romanticize that. <laughs> no, it was yeah. just like, you so know, I mean, it was all, it was all you know, I was a little bit out of place also. It's an all white town and stuff like that too. So that comes with certain challenges, but that, that, that was, that's not the main thing. It's just, it's a small town mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and a small town mindset in Canada is very different from a small town mindset here. I don't know how to explain it, but it's just, uh, yeah. What about uh, the the stage of your life where you lived in Hong Kong? Why did that? So come to be? yeah, I, I moved over to Hong Kong um, and opened up a business there. I had staff there and everything like that. And I thought of that would be a perfect balance between east and west, a perfect place. And you know, now we're thinking of growing a family, to to grow our kids up there, to get a little bit of the western perspective and the eastern perspective. But I just felt like, um, and this was before any of these protests or anything like that. I just felt like uh, it wasn't really. It was skewed a little bit. Um, there was definitely some discrimination against uh, mainlanders, um, mm. and uh, it wasn't really. Into There's lots of great people there too who are not, you know, local Hong Kongers who are not discriminatory in any way whatsoever. But I just felt like I, 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 I felt like it didn't have the right what the years ingredients. The, the, the what China years bug was it? We, we like to call it. What years? Um, uh. So that would have been. That would have been 2011, I think, uh, and then we were there. We were there full time for two years, and then we still had an apartment after that, and we were kind of back and right. forth. Um, 
but uh, yeah, somewhere around in and around that time frame. So you came, so you, you came to China in 2007. Uh, this is 14 years ago. Yeah, 2008 um, full time. Yeah, 13, 14 years ago. Um, any? What are the big changes you have uh, witnessed? Uh, I mean, the city. I mean, this is a city that's always changing, uh, infrastructure-wise, building-wise. Uh, you know, subway line. The subway used to end at the window of the world when I arrived, and now they've added like right. 200, 300 kilometers of mm. subway since then. You know, you compare that to Toronto, where they build like seven kilometers of subway. Uh, what was the mm. Shepherd Line? It takes them like 10, 10 years. <laughs> they're trying to build the, it in Tel Aviv for like 25 years already. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah when, we, when they said they're going to build a, a high-speed train from downtown Toronto to the airport, they had to talk about it for 30 years first. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> when they break ground, it'll take another yeah, 10 years, yeah. and it doesn't even end up being a high-speed train right <laughs> um, so the speed of development um, the um, is it is it specific for Shenzhen no I mean it's all over China or more in Shen places like Shenzhen I think Shenzhen is like a, a really a new city uh, compared to like Shanghai and Beijing so it was almost like a blank canvas that they could do anything they wanted right. with um, so probably it developed in a different way. Like if you look at Shenan Dao, you know, the main boulevard, like when they built that, they built that huge and people were like, why do you need such a big road? And it's like, but now Shenzhen is this mega right. metropolis. Um, so they built, they built Shenzhen to be a kind of the city of the future uh, late enough that they knew more or less what the city of the future needed. Vision. And then in terms of, you know, yeah, in terms of uh, all the buses are electric now, all the taxis are electric, the garbage trucks are electric, the big, huge dump trucks are changing to electric now too. Mm -hmm. uh, anything you miss, anything that was in some way better than here in China? Uh, you know, better in the 2008 version of China versus now? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I don't think so, no, because, uh. you know, like, you know, the, I would say if, you know, like the village areas of Baisha Zhou and stuff like that, these small village areas, if they ever destroyed those like they did with, you know, like uh, Kowloon Wall City. They and, do. And Hong, you know, they do. Like, so uh, I, I've, I would imagine people who are attached to those villages, well, that, that would be a loss. The one that I kind of, my stomping ground is still there. Mm. So if they, for now, if, if, for now yeah, <laughs> yeah, if they ever got rid of that, that I would be very saddened by that. But that's the price, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, progress. Yeah. Yeah. You travel a lot in China, right? Right, yeah. You've been to probably dozens of cities. Probably, yeah, like all, all, over, all over the place. All over yeah. China. And lately you've been doing it uh, in your own RV. Right. So why don't we talk a little bit about that? Um, right. Uh, what's the RV scene here in China like? It's growing really fast. Mm -hmm. um, uh, probably COVID gave it a boost also. Mm -hmm. You know, people want to travel around and be in their own space or something like that. No need um, to QR code. To yeah. get into your RV. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's growing. You know, the infrastructure isn't there in terms of having the same kinds of RV parks. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, you know, like for the RV parks, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do that, the the price of the RV parks that are in China right now is like the same price as a, a, a semi-decent hotel. Um, you know, if you're gonna pay 300 RMB to park overnight in an RV park, you can get a pretty decent hotel for that price. So why not mm -hmm. just you know, I, I yeah. re recently uh, I um, I was looking for uh, I saw some new camping uh, companies camping, so I was checking. I wanted to do a video, and I was checking what it is. And uh, one night, seven hundred RMB a person camping. So, oh yeah. Yeah, I it's, I, I couldn't understand it, but I mean, if you put the Chinese culture, and you can, you know. Um, they took camping and they're trying to make it something a little different, yeah, it's fancy, commercialized. commercialized, and people, Chinese people, go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I would never I, go camping yeah, for, for seven hundred. For, for us, like the RV, if we're gonna, we're either gonna stay in the RV or if we're gonna pay that much, we'll just stay in a hotel room where you have unlimited water, you know, yeah, and uh, right. more room to move around in, and you can still travel from spot to spot. Still nice to travel in the RV, but yeah, yeah. Any any places uh, you are planning to go to that you haven't been to yet in China? I'd like to go, I'd like to, in the summer when the kids are on their break, I'd like to take them to Inner Mongolia. Mm -hmm. I'd like to take the RV through there. Um, I mean, Xinjiang is something that's going to be happening soon, too. Uh, Qinghai, you know, all these kinds of places, yeah. In terms of RV, I mean, are there any apps that uh, are developed here in China to help the community? I mean, I'm talking about two things. One, probably just camping places or places yep. where you can just empty your, your, your tanks. Or, or, for example, just on highways, like, Height limitations. Yeah, so is the information the apps, like the uh, Baidu maps and um, I think Gaudi D2. I think they both uh, have. You can actually plug in the height of your vehicle into there, 
And then, oh. so it will navigate for you based on the height of your right. vehicle. My uh, uh, RV is not a uh, is a is a rise top, so I don't really have those restrictions. If we ever upgraded to a bigger RV, you can plug in the height of your vehicle. And then there are apps where yeah, people share the the coolest kind of campsites that they found. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like the one I sent you along the shore. Oh yeah. Uh, I found that from the app. Somebody else in an RV had stayed there, and they um, I, I, it looked pretty good. It looked like kind of what we're looking for, a quiet place. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. You visited a, a couple of factories, RV factories. You yep. got your factory from... I got my RV from uh, up in um, just Ooh. north of Wuhan. Okay. Uh, yeah. But you also visited the factory in Dongguan. Yeah, that guy that makes really... Uh, his RVs are actually better. Uh, they're, they're really nicely made, uh, boutique kind of, you know, handmade, custom-ordered uh, RVs. Um, and there's more and more places like that popping up. Do you think the, they'll reach the, the level of uh, van conversions? I'm not sure. Uh, I think uh, there are some people yeah, converting uh, like Ford Transits and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't be surprised, yeah, if they start doing those. I, ha I haven't seen too many of them. I think most people are they're just going on for full-on RVs mm -hmm. yeah, from what I've seen. Yeah. So I think that this will develop more RVs. Oh, it's going to explode. More it's gonna people, explode. more Chinese people will uh, will get into this kind of uh, yeah, absolutely with families and yeah. yeah, your family like it, yeah, yeah, they do, yeah, they, they do. do. <laughs> uh, the kids must love it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we say that in the end we are going to talk about uh, the presence of uh, uh, the elephant in the room. <laughs> yes, the China <laughs> yeah. YouTubers, right? What, yeah. what, what would you like to well, ask Daniel um, about? Well, I wanted to I wanted to ask you about your your opinion on the YouTube community, the uh, the China YouTube community, which is a little bit different between chi the ones in China or the ones who talk about China. Um, right. What do you think is, is how, how is this conversation going to be uh, dealt with? Do you know what I mean? Like in terms of, uh, are we talking like the, what, what usually people label as like anti-China or, or pro-China YouTubers? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think that th there should be people that criticize China. There should be people that criticize China online and, and uh, uh, hope to see improvements. But I think for most people, they go a little bit too far. They, they, that's not really what it's about. Um, I think, you know, the, the pro-China, anti-China argument is uh, kind of a superficial way to... Uh, to describe it also because it's just like this is our perspective this is like you know it, it, it so happens that it's favorable to china but that's not pro china it's just because i'm pro facts and based on the facts based on my uh, experiences this is what um i found um i think if uh instead of saying like anti-china or uh, uh pro china because there's some pretty nasty people out there there's yeah. some pretty nasty anyone in particular <laughs> uh, i don't want to say their names but um you know if, if you were to if you were to all of a sudden change the argument not from anti-china pro-china but are you a piece of shit or are you not a piece of shit i think it starts becoming a little bit more clear <laughs> when you've got these guys banding together like a guy who's uh killed his two dogs you know live like, with their corpses right. like seriously and then the the other two guys you know who are um the, you hear the stuff they say about uh, about Chinese people. You hear the stuff they, how they talk about poor people, you know, and it's like, you know, and, and they're all like, uh, you know, and then and then they've got the other guy that they get their footage from who lives in northern China, mm -hmm. who made a, a video about me. Um, he made this racist video, like pretending to be an Indian guy uh -huh. and saying like, oh, my dad's a taxi driver and all this kind of stuff, like all the Indian stereotypes. And it's like <laughs> when these kinds of guys are like banding together, like this is their clique. Like, what, what, like, are these people really uh, stable people that you want to be listening to? Uh, there's an interesting thing that you mentioned there because um, you're, you're talking about people who are coordinating, right? Somebody yeah. feed them, for example, B-roll to have in a green screen. Yeah. Um, what about the people who are on this side of the, of the argument trying to just present a positive light on China? Um, I've been uh, doing this for quite some time. But I don't see that much coordination in our messaging or in our videos or in our... So are we right. at a disadvantage? I don't know. I, I don't know if they're really coordinating their, mess <clears throat> their messages or if they're uh, on their side of their feeding off of each other or whatever. I, I don't know. Um, I don't think that's the biggest problem. Um, I think the biggest problem is, you know, there, there was... Um, you know, it's th th these same people uh, that we're talking about, they, s they said that... I remember one excuse they said why they talk about poverty in China but not in the U.S., and they say, because everybody knows that poverty exists in the U.S., so we have to talk about the stuff in China to make sure that people nobody know knows. about it. They're not talking about poverty alleviation. They're not talking about how many people left poverty, but they're saying this is why it's important to us. 
And um, it's like, well, if that is your principles that you work on, you go for the message that is uh, hidden or the one that's not, you know, there's plenty of anti-China content out there. There's a massive, you know, mass media is attacking China every single day. So, you know what? You could have been, especially you have a Chinese wife, you have mixed kids. You could have been the people that brought balance to the table. When there's an 867% attack on Asian Americans, you could have been the people who said, no, okay, guys, let's, let's take this back down a few a little bit of notches. Let's have a little bit of a more reasonable discussion on this. It's not really like that. Mm. They didn't bring balance. They fed into it. They jumped on the bandwagon. That they would give them the most votes when this mass of people... Uh, wanted to hear anti-China content, and then they go on to, and then they say, "Oh, you guys went on um, um, a CRI trip, and you know you're associating with these people, so you're, you're dancing by with vegetables." <laughs> While they're going on to uh, Falun Gong media outlets, on Falun Gong's website where they talk about what their religion is they say that they think mixed race children are an alien plot to divide humanity and they like, have and they have mixed race you know so this is if you're okay associating with this like you're throwing your family under the bus I during think, a time when anti china you know a, a, a asian american attacks on asian americans are skyrocketing this much i, I think it's it's pathetic um I, I only felt sorry for them in the beginning because i looked at them and said like if this is what you do every day, you just spew hate, like what must that do to your soul? What must that exactly. do to your energy? That mm. you wake up and you're going to make right. a video saying, how can I crap on China today? Um, I think, never I think that hate, hate works differently than love. And yeah, negative yeah. works different than positive. It has different energy. Yeah, and I, 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 was okay, I was okay leaving it alone and just like, I was like, you know what, this is, uh, I, I just feel more sorry for them than anything else. But I really believe they're directly responsible for a lot of the attacks overseas uh, where, where, where uh, uh, China as a whole and Chinese people are being villainized and uh, now people are being attacked and they're being killed like the the, old, right. the Thai man uh, who, who was uh, right. you know, pushed down it feels like when people are on YouTube they feel like oh my words just my words is, uh, they have no no weight they have no consequence and that's a huge thing I think that they know people they have consequence those kind of people like that's well, what I mean the consequence that, that we're talking about and, 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 I, and I talked in one of my videos before like there will be a point there they will probably have ha blood in their hands because of the right. messaging that oh, they're I sending. I think they already do. I think right. they already do. I just don't think they realize it. it. It definitely matches up. And it's not about balance. It's not about honesty. They made videos about animal abuse in China and animal rights in China. And their court, they are promoting a guy who, like we said, mm -hmm. killed his two dogs. And I, I, conf I said to him, I said, this is really weird. I said, you want to talk about... Uh, animal rights in China and you're not only not saying anything about this guy you're face to face with mm -hmm. who literally has an open arrest warrant on him for killing his two dogs you're promoting him mm. you've promoted his channel twice now you're saying oh everybody should check out his channel what, what's going on what's the disconnect mm -hmm. I said you know all of a sudden you're face to face with a white American and I said this might be the clue <laughs> uh, who abused his dogs, and you don't have anything to say about it anymore. Hmm. Um, they're just, uh, they're very dishonest, they're dangerous, um, and uh, I, I invited them, I invited him, uh, one of them for a debate, and uh, I even chose a moderator who was uh, more on the anti-China side, you could say. Um, definitely not, you know, friendly to my narrative, and I showed all the history in the Twitter, like this guy always, like, uh, uh, I want to say attacks my position, but it's critical, critical mm -hmm. of my position. And he said, no. No, but it's weird it. because they're talk they're talking about pro like the, that's the theme in their videos now. They're talking well, about pro China YouTubers if we want to use that superficial but they phrase. Want but they don't want to engage one face to face. When you had your show on Saturday, uh, they were asking, Oh, they would never have us on that show. They would never have us on that show to debate. Not that you invite them into debate. Yeah. Oh, they, they, they said that they yeah. said that we would never. De yeah. Oh, during that Saturday they, they show, they would never debate. Now oh. they were given the opportunity by me, yeah. and I, re I kept right. retweeting it. I'm like, come on, man, what, 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 what? And then he says, I would never debate him because he already chose the topic for the debate. I said, no problem. If you want to change it, I, I just made a suggestion. <laughs> if you want to change the topic, you, you can do whatever. I'll mm. do two on one. I'll do three on one if you want. Uh, wh whatever. Like, uh, but they know that they have to click, carefully rehearse their because they're. They know how hypocritical they are. They know they're not... Uh, somebody, somebody yesterday uh, was making a comment about the particular synergy that they had between them. That um, one of them has a very, very um, brittle ego. And uh, is always stepping over the other person. Right. When he ventures to give an idea, he'll just step over and say, like, no, that's not the way it is. Or you're wrong. Right. Or, or just always talking over each other. Um, I, I, I find that relationship to be very weak in a sense because if that other second guy were to realize that he's growing faster that he has an opportunity just to venture off 
That would be an interesting I development. Think, I think in general they are, they, are, they are quite weak, but hate, like I said before, works differently. And uh, what I mean, people, it's easier for some people to get drawn to that. Yeah, than, I think than to it, listen it, to it, something it, more it, smart. I, I, yeah, I think it's just uh, I don't know what 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 is going on between. Yeah, definitely one seems to dominate more than the other. Um, I think they're both very fragile, uh, fragile characters um, who I think that that pushes a lot of their negative content too. I think some people push back against some of the stuff they said before, and then they just doubled down. They're like, I'm going to show you, and then they mm -hmm. became even more unbalanced. Um, but um, it's just the two, it's the perfect storm of two really toxic uh, and racist. I'm going to call it, they're, they're absolutely racist. If you look at all the evidences there, I'm, I have, I'm, I mean, I know people who know them also. And, mm -hmm. and, and I never try to rely on that. But I, I know the stuff they used to say as well. But I, I don't even think I need to rely on that privileged information. I think it's apparent by their videos um, that they're toxic, racist individuals um, who just met, you know, met up at the right time to create this, I don't even know what to call it. There isn't even a word for that toxic relationship that they're in. Mm. Let's um, let's 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 talk the positive ones. Uh, yeah, okay. okay? <laughs> let's talk about <laughs> just <laughs> before <laughs> we end, right? Let's talk about the positive mm -hmm. ones. What do you, Daniel Dumbrill, watch? Who do you like? What do you who do you like? What do you watch on YouTube or other places? Like I um I don't really uh, like um do when I'm you on YouTube, I watch like documentaries. Okay. Uh, I watch um you know, so Adam Curtis has some really interesting documentaries and stuff like that. I don't really watch too many other vloggers. Once in a while, you know, um, uh, Cyrus puts out really interesting videos. Uh, Bay Area 415 really distills down uh, 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 heavy, complex topics really well. Um, Who do you think... Okay, I understand that. That kind of makes sense, what you're saying, right? Yeah. Because you, you do need to learn a lot... Uh, uh, um, to make research your content. To, to make your kind of content, yeah, I get it. But like you, you've watched the China YouTubers, right? Uh, at least one video, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah, know, yeah, 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 yeah. Who, who do you? What do you think about them? Who do you kind of like? They're different, right? A different kind of content. Yeah, um, yeah. Everybody's got their own personality. Uh, I think. Uh, Overall. Anyone in particular that you like, or, or? yeah, I mean, all uh, a bunch of them are really good. All, all of them are good. I mean, S Cyrus uh, puts out some um, really, really good videos. Right, I'm, I'm a big fan of. He's more like you, I think. Um, he uh, he does, he gets yeah. pretty analytical. I'd yeah. say he gets even more analytical than me. Um, right. But yeah, and um, uh, Jayo, he has some interesting rants sometimes. Where yes, like, I like his rants. <laughs> because, uh, for Jayo, it, it seems like, I mean, he's uh, contemplating an idea with himself also. He's not putting himself out there and saying, this is my idea, this is the way it is. He questions himself in his right. videos sometimes too, which I thought was really good, very reflective. It. He's saying, you know, am I wrong? Maybe, maybe right. I'm wrong and stuff like that. So I really uh, enjoyed that kind of right. a reflective uh, rant sometimes. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like we need to finish very soon, right? So yes. what's your plans for the future? Let's, let's finish with that. Like, with YouTube, uh, do you or have any plans, or are you just gonna keep doing what you've been I'm doing gonna, and see how I mean, it? Yeah, I mean, develops? as of this recording, I haven't uploaded a video for two weeks. Uh, I mean, if a, if a, if a topic um, is important enough or something like that, I'll put a video out. But uh, I mean, obviously, there's lots of stuff going on in real life as well. So uh, just kind of go with the flow uh, and continue learning. That's the most important thing. Uh, All right, continue learning. There's a bunch of books uh, that are on my to-read list. A uh, bunch of documentaries. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well. well yeah. Thank, thank you, you for having us here at Taps. Uh, we had a few of your beers last night. Yeah, yeah pretty the good. The Wuma beer was excellent. <laughs> the Wuma, the Wuma <laughs> beer. We didn't even talk about it. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, that's all for today. Thank yeah. you for having us. Like I yeah, said, and it was great to get to know you. Yeah, my better. pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. Cool. Thanks a lot, guys. Excellent. Okay. And that was of course China. Bye. Cheers. Bye.